All right, well, uh, thanks very much, Jacob, for organizing this and for inviting me to talk. And, uh, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, yep, so, uh, so I wanna begin uh, just by giving a little bit of a, an overview and kind of a, yeah, just a general orientation. Uh, so, so right, according to the Higgs Naturalist principle, right, BSM signature should have appeared at LHC energy scales. Um, but we observed, right, that there are no clear BSM signatures at the LHC. And so this raises the puzzle of where the naturalness argument went wrong, if, if it did. And so, um, so there are a few diagnoses of, of what's happened in this case. So, for example, uh, Borelli and Castellani, right, so, so Ariana um, noted that the naturalness is something of an amorphous criterion that can be molded to justify one's chosen research program, um, you know, rather than being a principle to uphold at all costs. Um, Alex has noted, right, the delicate sensitivities that stand in the way uh, of autonomy of high level regularities are sensitivities um, to states rather than parameters, but really it's, it's sensitivity to parameters that, that is what we have in, in the context of the standard model. Uh, and, uh, and Sabina Hassenfelder has argued that there's no good way to really justify the choice of probability distribution over fundamental parameter space that permits us to characterize certain parameter values as quote unlikely. Okay, so I just want to orient my own position with respect to these these commentaries. Um, so, so I'm sympathetic with with a great deal of what Ariana said, but I think that that to some extent, right? So, so there are lots of ways of characterizing naturalness, but there seems to be a certain core of a naturalness principle that's sufficiently well defined to generate a testable empirical prediction, right? namely the prediction that we should have observed uh, new physics at the LHC. Right. So, so I would say that there, you know, among all of the, the many ways of characterizing the naturalness principle, there is a sort of solid core that generates this, this that's well defined enough to generate a testable prediction. Um, yeah, so with Alex, um, so, so his characterization, so I agree that the, the distinction between kind of parameter sensitivity and, and state sensitivity is, is extremely important and relevant. Um, and, you know, I, mean, I think basically, you know, David's arguments that you know parameters at one level can be contingent or dependent on the state at a deeper level. This is an important qualification to that distinction. Um, I would say that the the view of naturalness advocated in this talk is really based on a fundamentally different way of understanding effective field theories, um, which I'll go into. Um, and the, the difference is essentially that you know the, the, this notion of fundamental parameters, this notion that the kind of you know low lambda or low mu right low scale parameters are somehow supervenient upon our coarse grainings of high scale parameters. Um, I think that's open to doubt, and I'll explain why um, in a second. So 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 there's no so I would say that the, the viewing low scale parameters you know as related to high scale parameters in terms of some sort of supervenience relationship or bridge laws um, may be maybe not the right way of looking at that relationship. Um, with respect to Hassenfelder. Right, who says that there's just no good way to justify the choice of probability distribution over the fundamental parameter space. Um, yeah, I would say that the problem, I, I mean, I agree that that's a problem, but I would say that the problem even goes deeper than that, but the, the very notion of a fundamental parameter space is in some sense ill-defined. Right, and so the way in which I'll attempt to kind of diagnose the problem with the naturalness argument here, is that it really relies with certain unresolved tensions in the foundations of quantum field theory. Right? And in particular, the status of regularization and renormalization scheme independence within the modern understanding of QFTs as effective field theories. Right? so I'm gonna argue that there's a fundamental tension between a certain way of understanding effective field theories and the kind of time-honored principles of regularization and renormalization scheme independence. Okay, so the talk's gonna be divided into two parts. Um, so the first part is going to argue that, um, that in fact, all formulations of the naturalness principle that are relevant to the prediction of BSM signatures at the LHC, right, tacitly or explicitly, right, somehow loosen or suspend either the notion of regularization scheme invariance or the notion of renormalization scheme invariance, right? So they, they're at odds with some notion of scheme independence. So they suspend one, one or another principle of scheme independence. Um, then I'll argue that there's, there's a way of looking at effective field theories, right, that, that, that doesn't violate this, 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 this scheme independence, right, so that, 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 that's more respectful of the, 
kind of time honored principles of regularization scheme independence and 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 renormalization scheme independence. Um, right, so so I'll argue that the notion that every effective field theory comes equipped with a uniquely physically preferred unique physically preferred parameterization is in some sense an idle metaphysical posit that can be removed without altering the physical predictions of the EFT or you know, or the mathematical well-definedness that comes with finite cutoff parameterizations right, or the possibility of giving a realist interpretation. Right, so I'll argue that one does not need to adopt the notion of a single preferred set of parameters or a single set of fundamental parameters or physical parameters right, in order to, to allow for an effective field theory to be well-defined or, or to give a realist interpretation. And the third central claim is that abandoning right, the notion of a physically preferred parameterization actually has certain implications for how one interprets things like the path integral and Wilsonian RG transformations and, uh, and the cutoff parameter lambda and also how one defines the Hilbert space of, of a quantum field theory. Okay, so part one, right? So, so I'll just, this, so this is the part that argues that, that all formulations of the naturalness principle rel relevant to the prediction of BSM signatures of the LHC Right, tacitly or explicitly violates some notion of scheme independence. Right, so the Higgs pole mass, which is really the, the, the physical Higgs mass, right, it's the thing that's most directly measured. Right, so the, the kind of traditional formulation of the problem in terms of bare parameters, right, notes that in order to recover the, 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 the measured value of the Higgs pole mass, right, one needs a, to assume a very delicate cancellation Right, between the, the, the bare Higgs mass and the, the quadratically divergent quantum corrections. And so the larger this parameter lambda is, right, the more delicate the, 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 the cancellation needs to be. Right? And typically, right, one assumes that this lambda, right, this cutoff regulator, right, is, is set equal to the actual physical cutoff of the standard model, right, the scale at which the standard model ceases to be empirically adequate. And so there are a number of ways of you know, interpreting this, this bare fine tuning relation, All right? So the first is a probabilistic interpretation, right? So it's unlikely that the bare fundamental parameters would be such that the bare mass squared and quantum corrections cancel almost exactly, right? So the idea just going back, right? Is that, that, that things like M zero and, and Y and Lambda, they're all independent parameters. So, so it's, 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 it's mysterious that, you know, if we assume that these are all specified independently, um, that, that, that they would somehow exhibit this very delicate and conspiratorial seeming cancellation. Right, and so, right, so, so this notion that, that it's somehow unlikely that one would get this cancellation um, right, assumes implicitly some smooth probability distribution over the bare fundamental parameter space. There's a second way of interpreting this fine tuning relationship, which is based kind of on the notion of sensitivity of observables to, to the fundamental parameters. Right, so it's notes, notes that the Higgs pole mass is delicately sensitive to small changes in the bare fundamental parameters. Um, so there's something kind of intrinsically problematic about the sensitivity, or there's supposed to be. Um, and right, so this, this particular way of understanding it doesn't necessarily need to assume a probability distribution over the fundamental parameter space to the extent that right, the, the problem with these delicate cancellations and sensitivities right, isn't a problem of unlikely parameters. There's, there's some, some intrinsic, so some, some problem that's in, there's some intrinsic problem with this sensitivity. Okay, so, so there's an old worry um, about the bare fine tuning relation, right? In, the, in these arguments that they depend on a particular choice of regulator, right? So, so, right, so we all learn right, in quantum field theory, and you know, when, when we take it that, that you know, the physical quantum, content of a quantum field theory shouldn't depend on your choice of regulator, right? And it shouldn't depend on your choice of renormalization scheme. Okay, um, so so the, so the, so the kind of immediate worry about this 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 initial kind of fine tuning argument, the bare fine tuning argument, is that you know aren't these delicate cancellations and sensitivities merely artifacts of a regularization scheme? Um, yep. So so that's that's the kind of immediate worry, and so I think this worry has been largely dismissed um, on the basis of two responses, two types of response, and they're they're, they're quite distinct uh, in the assumptions that they make. Um, so one response is to reformulate the naturalness argument in these kind of delicate cancellations and sensitivities uh, in a regulator independent way, right? So one kind of circumvents the, the, the critique, uh, the criticism of regular, regulator dependence, right? By, by, by reformulating the argument in a regulator independent way in terms of renormalized parameters. Um, 
the second response right assumes the existence of a physics so so basically says well no nature in nature there is a physically preferred regulator and there are real values for the bare parameters right so so at, at the cutoff scale right you know there are matters of fact about what the true bare parameters of the theory are and there's a there's a matter of fact about about what the real regulator is so so it's no problem for the bare fine tuning argument that it, that it depends on a regulator because in some sense you know it's the truth about nature that it depends on a particular choice of regulator and uh and so what i'm going to claim here is that both arguments both responses to the initial worry about scheme dependence are too quick so they're, they're flawed in their own ways um, so the initial worry about scheme independence, I argue, was actually on the right track, but it needs to be generalized and extended and fleshed out. Okay, so I'll just go into more detail about the first response, right, which is based, so, so this is the response, remember, that circumvents the worry about uh, regularization scheme independence right, by reformulating the, the naturalness argument and the fine tuning argument in terms of renormalized parameters. Right, and so this 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 argument is often illustrated in the context of a toy model, right? But but you know, in principle, it ought to extend to more complicated theories like the standard model, and and whatever theory lies beneath, right? And so you know this this argument, which many of you will be familiar with, right? So so suppose we have some full theory, right? So some light scalar, which is supposed to be like the Higgs, uh, and it's coupled to a heavy fermion, uh, and so so we, where the the mass of the fermion is is much much greater. Right, so we can describe the light scalar right in terms of some EFT Lagrangian, right, where the right where the the parameters of the of the light field Lagrangian will associated with the with the light field will in general be different from the parameters associated with the light field within the context of the full Lagrangian. And so we can determine these parameters in the light field Lagrangian by matching performing matching calculations on light field observables, right, like S matrix elements and pole masses. Um, using the MS bar scheme in both in both theories, and so what we get when you know we perform that matching calculation is that the light scalar mass in the effective theory in the light field effective theory right is equal to the um, mass in the of the light scalar in the full theory right minus some matching corrections or you know, altered by some matching corrections, which depend quadratically on the mass of the heavy particle that's been integrated out. And so this is very similar in appearance to the bare fine tuning relationship. Right. And so one can kind of rehearse the same sort of arguments, right, within this renormalized formulation, right? So, so one has a, an unlikely delegate cancellation between right the 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 scalar mass in the full theory and the matching corrections. And it's a very delicate cancellation that's required to recover the small value of the MS bar mass parameter right, in the light field effective theory. Right. And so this notion that there's an unlikely delicate cancellation, right? And implicitly this notion of unlikeliness, right, assumes in some sense of probability distribution over the MS bar parameter space of the full theory. Right. One can also give a sensitivity-based formulation. Right. So the light scalar effective field theory mass right, is delicately sensitive to small changes in the dimensionless mass and coupling. Right? And there's no probability distribution is assumed. And so, you know, as to, to why the sensitivity is a problem, right? So Alex has gone into the depth about some of the reasons why it's considered to be a problem, right? Just sensitivity in and of itself. Um, and so, so I won't rehearse um, that too much here since he's already done an excellent job. Um, so, so the important point about this renormalized fine tuning argument is that there is no dependence on any sort of regulator, right? So all parameters are renormalized parameters. Right. So it appears that the initial worry about regularization scheme independence has been circumvented. In a sense. And uh, I want to argue here that that's too quick, in a sense, that, that these renormalized formulations simply trade one kind of scheme, independ scheme dependence for another. Right. So rather than depending on a particular choice of regularization scheme, instead they privilege a certain sorts of re renormalization scheme. Right. So these fine tuning relations rest on a particular renormalization scheme instead of a regularization scheme. Right, so in particular, right, we can we can transform away the fine tuning relations, right, the renormalized fine tuning relations, just by renormalizing both the full and the effective theories in the on shell scheme, so that the light field mass parameters are the same in both theories, and they're both set equal to the pole mass. Right, and so in, in these schemes, right, there there the matching corrections are completely absent. Right, there just simply aren't any matching corrections, uh, and so there's no need for fine tuning. Right, and so the need for delicate cancellations between the scalar mass and the matching corrections, right appears to be an artifact of a particular renormalization scheme. It may be calculationally convenient, but from the point of view of 
you know, ontological considerations, right? The 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 on shell scheme would seem to be just as good, and there are no fine tunings needed there among the renormalized parameters. So one way to rescue right this response to this defensive naturalness, you know, in terms of renormalized parameters, right, is, is so 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 one sometimes here it's reference to the running MS bar parameters as the physical parameters of the theory. Right, and the running MS bar mass is the is the effective mass at scale mu, right? Where mu is the the MS bar renormalization scale, which is actually a very abstractly defined quantity. Um, so, um, right, so so just as the notion right of right, bare fundamental parameters suspends the principle of regularization scheme independence, so the view of MS bar parameters as a somehow uniquely physical parameters of the theory. Right, they 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 assume a physically preferred renormalized parameterization, and and in that sense, seem to suspend the principle of renormalization scheme independence. And as much as they they say, that, well, okay, it's these particular renormalized parameters that are the physical parameters, and any other renormalized parameters are somehow less physical or, or less representative, um, you know, of, of the true physics. Uh, and so, but you know, and I think one one obvious flaw with this sort of way of thinking. You know, is that to the extent that any renormalized parameters deserve to be counted as physical parameters, one would think it would be the on shell parameters, right, where the, the masses are actually defined as the pole mass, right, and there's a much more direct relationship between the Lagrangian parameters and physical observables like scattering cross sections uh, and, and pole masses. You know, so the MS bar scheme is just really, you know, I mean, the, 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 the running scale is defined basically just as a mathematical construct to make the dimensions of, of certain couplings correct when you analytically continue into you know beyond four space-time dimensions so so really i mean the the m to, to, to see the ms bar parameters is the kind of uniquely physical parameter uniquely physical parameterization of the theory strikes me as a somewhat odd sort of assumption to make um and so basically the conclusion here is that, that whether we're talking about right the bare or the renormalized formulation of the, the higgs naturalness argument in, 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 right, in these fine-tuning relations which you know also i think encompass this sort of autonomy of scales thinking in as much as they that preclude a certain sensitivity of observables to fundamental parameters, um, right? So, so whether whichever you know formulation we're talking about, it's only by relaxing the principle of regularization or renormalization scheme independence in some sense that the arguments based on naturalness get any sort of traction, right? So, so the argument here really is that there there exists a very strong tension between the Higgs naturalness principle and the combined principles of regularization and renormalization scheme independence. And I think that there's been this kind of latent tension or that is what I'm arguing here, right? Between this kind of time honored principles of regularization and renormalization scheme independence and, and naturalness based reasoning. Okay, and so what I wanna argue for here is, is, a, is a view of effective field theories that doesn't rely on a sort of preferred renormal, you know, preferred parameterization or you know, a, a kind of tacit suspension of renormalization or regularization scheme independence. Okay, so I just wanna go back to these two. So, so there was the initial worry about regularization scheme independence of the bare fine tuning argument, right? And I said, okay, well, one response to that was right, reformulate the naturalist argument in a regulator independent way, but we found, well, if you do that, then you just, you, you trade one form of scheme independence for scheme dependence for another, right? Uh, and so a second response, right, is that, so, so, so I, I saw kind of take that as response to have been addressed, although you know, certainly feel free to, to, to question where I've left it in the question period. Um, but the second response is that there, there exists, right, a physically preferred regulator and parameterization for any EFT. So the suspension of regularization or renormalization scheme invariance is just justified. So the right, so the idea is just to say, well, no, we'll just accept the kind of violations of the suspension of regularization and renormalization scheme invariance because we shouldn't take those principles too seriously. And so uh, for the remainder of the talk, uh, I'll focus on addressing the second response. Okay. So given that regularization and renormalization scheme independence remain deeply entrenched as foundational principles of quantum field theory, what motivates the often tacit suspension of these principles for the purpose of naturalness based arguments? And I think that there are kind of two rationales. So for relaxing regularization scheme invariance, right? So in condensed matter theory, right, one particular regulator, or right, so say associated with the atomic lattice spacing, right, and one set of parameters which describe the kind of interactions between the, the displacements of atoms on the lattice 
right? They do constitute a true underlying parameterization and a, and a true underlying regulator for, for a field theoretic description of, of the condensed matter uh, system, right? So, so within the context of condensed matter theory, right, there are very good reasons, and I think it's relatively uncontroversial to, to assume that in some sense there is a physically preferred regulator, right? And that there are there is a physically preferred bare parameterization. Uh, and so, right, so the notion of a fundamental bare parameterization in the EFTs of high energy physics, on the other hand, right, I think so that results from an attempt to transplant this kind of intuitively, intuitive, mathematically well defined picture of quantum fields, right, that one has in the context of condensed matter theory to the description of elementary particle interactions, right, and, and so suspension of regularization invariance by adopting some physically preferred regulator, right, provides a path toward a mat mathematically well defined formulation as well as a kind of clearer physical interpretation of, of, of quantum field theory within high energy physics. So that's kind of the rationale right, for, for abandoning uh, regularization scheme invariants, right? It's just that, that, you know, that, that this kind of condensed matter perspective right, makes things mathematically better defined and more physically intuitive. All right, but then right, there's a second rationale, which is right for relaxing renormalization scheme invariants. All right, and so in conventional approaches to perturbative renormalization, right, the bare parameters are infinite and therefore have kind of no claim to physicality. Right, by comparison, it's tempting to regard renormalized parameters, which are finite, as the physical parameters of the theory, right, just by virtue of their finiteness. And so it's tempting to regard the renormalized mass as an effective mass at some physical scale, um, you know, by analogy, both with the effective masses of say quasi particles and condensed matter field, field theory, or with the effective charge, say the running charge different scales of the electron. Right. Um, so those are kind of the rationales for, you know, not taking scheme independence too seriously. Um, and so, and so with associated with these rationales, I think there are also different kind of views of, of the cutoff regulator. So, right, so within the kind of perturbative, you know, traditional kind of perturbative quantum field theory, Right, so it's assumed that the cutoff regulator must be taken to infinity at the end of the calculation. Right, so, so because lambda is inserted as an arbitrary parameter solely for the purpose of rendering loop integrals finite, right, um, right, we should take lambda to infinity at the end of calculations since, since infinity is in sense the only non-arbitrary value for this parameter. Right, and you know, but the problem is really with, with this continuum limit is when one goes to kind of the non-perturbative realm. Right, so although it's possible to extract well-defined predictions Right, and the continuum limit in the context of perturbative approximations, the continuum limit uh, continues to pose mathematical problems in the more general kind of non-perturbative realm. And so one way of getting around these problems with the continuum limit right, um, is to adopt this kind of condensed matter style approach, right, to say, well, no, actually there is a physically preferred value of, of the cutoff regulator and it's equal to the physical cutoff of the effective field theory. So it's, it's whatever scale, the scale at which the effective field theory ceases to generate um, accurate predictions, right? So, so the, the idea is that quantum field theories, right, only describe phenomena up to some finite physical cutoff scale, which I'll call M phys. And so it's not necessary for a quantum field theory to be mathematically defined up to arbitrarily large values of lambda, but only up through the physical cutoff. So it's natural simply, you know, by analogy with what one does in condensed matter theory to set the cutoff regulator equal to the physical cutoff. And so by analogy with condensed matter theory, Right, yeah, so, so we, just, we just set the regulator lambda equal to the physical cutoff. And so this appears to fix problems of mathematical well-definedness in the non-perturbative realm that are associated with the, the continuum approach. And in many ways it does, right? So, so when one has, one can put anything on a computer in principle and you know, in the non, you know, if one has a finite cutoff, then and even in the non-perturbative realm in, in, in principle, everything is, is, can be computed. There's a third view Right, that's much less commonly discussed, but that's um, been kind of tested, especially in the work of Tim Morris um, on, on the kind of functional renormalization group, which is this idea of kind of uh, quotienting over the Wilsonian RG flow. Right, so basically just declaring the physical equivalence of finite cutoff parameterizations. Right, and so this 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 sort of interpretation is just rooted in a basic mathematical fact. Right, about correlation functions, the path integral, S matrix elements, and any observables computed from them, right, which is namely that if one attributes a cutoff dependence to the bare parameters that's given by some solution to the Wilsonian renormalization group equations, right, then essentially the, the, right, these quantities are, are cutoff independent. Right? So 
Um, right, so, 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 so essentially one, irrespective of the value of lambda that one, one assigns, right, one gets the same values for all physical observables, um, right? One can just, uh, by, by making, right, if one adjusts lambda, right, one can make compensating adjustments to G of lambda, right, and in order to recover the exact same physical predictions. Right. And so distinct parameterizations along the same Wilsonian RG trajectory right, are just taken to constitute physically equivalent representations of the same physical state of affairs. Right. And so, right, so, so an EFT here is not associated with any specific value of lambda right, or any specific values of the, of, 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 of the, of the parameters G, right, but rather um, right, it's, it's associated with an entire RG trajectory. Right, so it's basically right. So, so when it's just a, phys, a set of physically equivalent parameterizations, all that lie along the same RG trajectory, right? And it's mathematically well defined, right? Since it deals with just finite cutoff parameterizations, right? But it just declares those to be physically equivalent, right? An important distinction with the condensed matter style approach is that the physical cutoff actually appears nowhere in the mathematical definition of the EFT, right? So. So I'll review basically just a, a number of dogmas of effective field theory kind of on the condensed matter style approach, right? And then I'll say how we, when, do these can be revised right, when one abandons the assumption of a physically preferred parameterization, right? So, so in the condensed matter view, recall, so one basically defines the theory with the, the cutoff regulator equal to the physical cutoff, right? And the assumption, one assumption, right, is that each EFT comes equipped with a unique physically preferred parameterization, right, whether that comes in the form of a bare, fu bare fundamental parameters or renormalized physical parameters, right? And so the cutoff regulator really does have a single physically correct value, which is the physical cutoff of the EFT, right? This further assumes that the momenta P of incoming and outgoing particles in the S matrix must lie below the scale lambda set by the regulator. And it assumes that bare parameters at small values of lambda are coarse grainings in some sense of bare parameters at larger lambda, right? And that each point along a Wilsonian RG trajectory associated with a different lambda constitutes a distinct effective field theory. And moreover, right, the EFT's Hilbert space is defined with respect to the physical cutoff scale, right? So it's, for example, it's defined, right? So one associates a Hilbert space with each lattice point, right? So say with a field degree of freedom at each lattice point, and then just takes a tensor product of all those overall lattice points, right? And, and, and so in some sense, the Hilbert space of the theory is defined, right, at the physical cutoff scale. Okay, now I wanna argue that, that there's a different way of interpreting the formalism of EFTs, right, that abandons some of these dogmas. Okay. So, right, so, so I argue here, right, an EFT is not defined by any single parameterization, but by an equivalence class of parameterizations Right, which are related by changes of the scale parameter lambda or mu, right? So either via the Wilsonian or the continuum renormalization group, or, or by the process of renormalization or changes of renormalization scheme, right? So there's basically a physically there's, a, there's an equivalence class of, of, of different parameterizations, right, all of which give the same physics, right? Give the same values for physical observables. And so, right? So, so there's no single parameterization that's preferred. It's just all, all parameterizations are in some sense physically equivalent. Uh, right, and so the cutoff regulator lambda right here is just, it's just an arbitrary parameter, right? And it may take any value for which the Wilsonian RG trajectory is mathematically defined, right? So, 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 so here, right, the lambda is actually viewed as, as very sharply distinct from the physical cutoff, right? So, so the physical cutoff, right, has no place in the mathematical definition of the EFT, right? To, to, to generate the predictions of the EFT, it just suffices to have some value of lambda and some value of the bare parameters G, and that's, sufficient mathematical structure to generate correlation functions and S matrix elements. There's no need to set lambda equal to the physical cutoff. And I'll explain that remark further below. Moreover, I argue, right, the momenta P of the incoming and outgoing particles, right, so given this distinct interpretation of the cutoff regulator lambda, right, so the momenta P of incoming and outgoing particles in S matrix may actually lie above right, or, be or below the scale of lambda without affecting the theory's predictions. So actually lambda, right, does not need, I think that's it. So I argue that this is actually kind of a, a misinterpretation of the, of the nature of the parameter lambda, that it needs to always lie above the incoming outgoing momenta of, in the S matrix. Okay. And so, and moreover, I argue that bare parameters at small values of lambda are not coarse grainings of bare parameters at large lambda, 
or actually both contain the same information. And the flow along a single fixed trajectory is in fact reversible. And I'll again, explain all of these and argue, argue for all these points uh, in a moment. Right? And so, so points along a Wilsonian RG trajectory, I argue are just distinct parameterizations of one and the same EFT associated with one and the same set of physical amplitudes. Right? And the EFT's Hilbert space ought to be defined independently of the value of lambda, right? Um, right, rather than right, in terms of the physical cutoff scale. Okay. So, right, so I want to draw a distinction right, between these two notions. So, so, so I argue that, 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 that the cutoff regulator and the physical cutoff are actually two very sharply distinct notions of cutoff right, that, that, that ought not to be conflated. Um, so, right, so in high energy physics, right, the regulator lambda, right, um, right, okay, so, so, oh, sorry, um, so, so, yeah, so basically, so, so lambda is really an arbitrary parameter, right, I argue, and again, this will be argued further below, that can be varied without changing the physical content of the theory, whereas, right, the physical cutoff is an empirically observable quantity, such that different values of the physical cutoff necessarily correspond to physically distinct states of affairs. So, the, so one important distinction is that one can vary lambda without changing the, the, the state of affairs, the physical state of affairs as described by the field theory. Whereas if one changes the physical cutoff, right, that necessarily corresponds to a distinct physical state of affairs. So the physical cutoff really is more about characterizing the relationship between the EFT model and the world, and not about the internal mathematical features of the EFT model. Right, which can be defined without reference to the physical cutoff. So one, one defines the model without reference to the physical cutoff, right? And then one finds by comparing the model's predictions to the world what the physical cutoff is, but the physical cutoff is not an intrinsic mathematical feature of the EFT model. Okay, so, um, right, so, 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 so I'll basically go about kind of explaining how the path integral and the Wilsonian renormalization group Right, can be reinterpreted in, in this alternative way. But first I'll kind of review the kind of condensed matter style interpretation of the, of the path integral, right? So, so it's often assumed, right, that the path integral cutoff at the scale lambda only describes scattering phenomena with external momenta P less than lambda, right? And this perspective is motivated by analogies with condensed matter physics, right? Since modes can't propagate in a material if their wavelength is less than the inter interatomic spacing. Right? so it just seems like a non-starter that P would be larger than lambda, Right, because, because modes can't propagate if their wavelength is shorter than the lattice spacing. And so this kind of motivates a view of small lambda parameterizations as coarse grainings of, and this is supervenient upon high lambda parameterizations. However, if we just remove the physical interpretation for a moment and just look at the mathematical definition of a finite cutoff path integral, right, it actually doesn't require that um, the external momenta be less than lambda. Right, so what matters to the value of things like correlation functions and observables is the dependence of the path integral on the external source fields, J. Right, so there's a formula, right? So it's a very common formula for, that expresses correlation functions, right? As functional derivatives, right? Of the, uh, of the path integral, right? As, as a function of, of the external sources, right? And this dependence, right? So the dependence of the path integral on the external source fields remains unaltered irrespective of the value of lambda. Okay. So, and then this is actually a fairly pedestrian point, right? So, so if you just consider, right, a, a general multivariate integral, right? So, 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 you know, the regularized path integral would be a special case of this, right? So one has, right? So imagine that one has some function F, right? Which is a function of some variables X1 to Xn and some variables j1 to jn, right? And then one partially integrates over, say, right, some of the variables xl, so xl plus one to xn, right? Then by partially integrating f sub n over those, those, those variables x, right, one achieves a different integrand. Right? But ultimately, right, what, one, what variables one partially integrates over actually has no effect on the partial derivatives of the function z of j with respect to the ji, right? So, so the partial derivatives of z with respect to j are unaffected by which, right, which x's we partially integrate over, right, to, to, to get the integrand, right? So, um, so, so, so the partial derivatives of z with respect to j are, you know, don't, don't depend on the value of l essentially here, right? And, and, and so, right, so, so if we just, right, identify z of j1 to jn with the path integral as a function of the external sources, 
the XIs with the Fourier transformed fields and the JIs with the Fourier transformed source functions and L with lambda, right? Then we see that lambda is really just a demarcation between right, those variables in the path integral that one has explicitly integrated over and, and the, those that have not, right? So, so it's, it's, it's in some sense, right? So, 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 so it doesn't need to be endowed with this interpretation as a physical cutoff. Okay, so, 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 right, so, 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 so it's really an additional act of physical interpretation that endows lambda with the interpretation of the physical cutoff. There's nothing that necessitates that interpretation. Okay. Moreover, right, so it's often thought that right, the Wilsonian RG flow from high lambda to low lambda, right, is a coarse graining. So it's an irreversible coarse graining operation, right, in which information is lost, right? Um, and, and, and I want to say that, so that there, there are clearly there are pretty obvious limitations to that idea, right? So, for example, how does one discover that QED has a Landau pole unless one can run up to the renormalization scale to high scale, the, the renormalization group flow to high scales, right? So, um, right, so, so one only discovers the existence of a Landau pole by reversing the RG flow and flowing it up to high. So, so clearly there's some sense in which the RG flow is reversible, right? And, and, and another point in, in support of that is the fact that the, the RG equations are first order, right, in Lambda. So assuming that one stays on the same RG trajectory, one can go back and forth between it. Now, of course, RG trajectories converge around the renormalized trajectory. And so the moment one makes some measure of approximation, one loses information, right? But if one doesn't make that approximation and one stays along the same RG trajectory, then, then one can flow up or down freely. Okay, so, but there is of course a sense in which the RG flow to low from high to low lambda is irreversible. And, 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 the, and the sense in which the RG flow is irreversible is that for arbitrary initial conditions, so if you start at some scale lambda zero, right? With some bare parameters G zero, then a solution to that with those initial conditions will exist for all lambda less than L, lambda zero, but not for all lambda greater than lambda zero. So this is sort of, it's mathematically analogous to the sense in which you know, it's possible with gener generic initial conditions of the heat equation to flow them arbitrarily far into the future, but not arbitrarily far into the past. All right, so again, shorn of any physical interpretation, right? A Wilsonian RG trajectory can simply be understood as a sort of level set of the EFT path integral, right? So, right, so if we have some function, you know, so just generically, right, just from first year analysis, right, if you have some function of X and two variables, X and Y, right, and you set that equal to some constant, right, then that defines Y as a function of X through the implicit function theorem, right? And one can view the path integral in the same way. So the path integral is a function of, right, the, the parameters, so it's the bare parameters and the cutoff, right? And, and, and if one requires that the value of the path integral be fixed, right, then that establishes some functional dependence of the parameters on the cutoff, right? And so from this perspective, right, the motion along a single fixed RG trajectory entails no loss of information, right? And so, and so what I wanna argue here, right, is that, is that, that because all parameterizations along the same RG trajectory or in all renormalization schemes, right, um, or all regularization schemes, right? They ultimately give the same values for observables, right? The notion of a physically preferred regulator or set of fundamental bare parameters or, or preferred set of renormalized parameters, right? The, 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 the notion of a preferred parameterization constitutes a theoretically idle supposition. So it's just an idle wheel, right? It plays no essential role in generating the successful predictions of the EFT, right? Which can be generated in principle using any regularization or renormalization scheme, right? And so, the position taken here is that the notion of, of a preferred parameterization, again, whether it's a fundamental, you know, fundamental, you know, fundamental bare parameterization, or you know, the renormalized physical parameters, right? That, that, that in some sense that's a kind of metaphysical excess baggage that should be abandoned, right? And so I just want to make a case for abandoning, you know, just in more detail, the case for abandoning the notion that that you know, an effective field theory comes equipped with any single set of you know, physically preferred parameters. Um, and, right, so, so one point in, in favor of that, right, is that the, the measured quant, you know, also the, so the quantities that we measure at accelerators, right, so like cross sections, right, are re regularization and renormalization scheme independent, right? So, so, the, so the, the, the quantities 
through which right the formalism of EFTs makes contact with 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 the phenomena and with 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 empirical you know with 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 you know with experiment is through scheme independent quantities um, right and also right so it's thought that well okay if we could only probe physics near the cutoff scale right then you know we we would somehow be able to measure the bare parameters right um, but I mean there are there are many case examples of EFTs where we're able to probe physics near the cutoff scale of that EFT. Right, so for example, Fermi weak theory QED, but there's no sense in which one directly measures right, the values of the bare parameters or empirically determines the correct regularization scheme. Right? So, so being able to probe physics near the cutoff does not somehow grant access to you know, the, the, the one true set of parameters for that EFT. Yeah. Um, right. And moreover, right, and I think that the, you know, the, the actual practice of effective field theory calculations is consistent with, I think, the what I, you know, what I'm talking about, and in some sense, tacitly understands this, right? That, that the matching calculations really only require theories to agree on scheme-independent quantities like pole masses and scattering amplitudes, right? Not on the values of Lagrangian parameters or other scheme-dependent quantities. So, in principle, when one's matching between different effective field theories, right? Any parameterization scheme, right? Employing any regulator and any renormalization scheme can be employed in either theory during the matching calculation. So. So the, the, some of the idea of being able to probe physics near the cutoff or knowing the next theory, right, actually doesn't necessarily establish um, right, any, any preferred scheme. And so I want to argue that this is in some, in some important respects, right, certainly not in all respects, but in some relevant respects, right, there's an, an analogy here between the assumption of a preferred parameterization and the assumption of a preferred reference frame or stand, a standard of rest, right, in the, you know, in, in, the, in, in the 19th century theory, ether theory of light, right? So, right? so in the 19th century, it was assumed that electromagnetic waves must propagate in some physical medium, which was called the ether, right? And just as the medium for sound waves establishes a preferred notion of rest, so it was thought that the ether had to assume a preferred standard of rest in the propagation of light waves, right? And, but, but experiments continually failed to reveal any preferred standard of rest. And so it was recognized, right, ultimately, that, that the assumption of a preferred standard of rest is just an idle posit, right? You don't need it to generate the successful predictions of Maxwell's theory, right? It played no essential role. And it was just kind of metaphysical excess baggage. And, and so, right, and so just as it, it's proved impossible to establish any absolute standard of rest through empirical means in the context of electromagnetic theory, Right, so the scheme, right, so the, the empirical support for the standard model, right, is the scheme independent. So it doesn't establish any single parameterization as the true parameters of the theory, right? And so I argue, right, that the notion of fundamental parameters really ought to be regarded with the same skepticism as the ether, right? And for largely the same reasons, right? It just does, it's not necessary to generate the successful predictions of the theory, right? It violates an invariance that is respected by the phenomena. And so there's just no necessity for, for, for violating that invariance, right? And so if one wants to be a real, so, so, right, so traditionally, right, if one wants to be a realist about QFT, I think so that, you know, the, there's a sort of this condensed matter approach, right, has often been a popular way to go about it because the condensed matter approach is sort of well-defined, right, that's kind of cut off, right? The, the, the physical picture of condensed matter systems is very physically intuitive, right? But I want to argue that that's, that's not really, Right, so, so kind of fixation on that particular metaphysical picture is not reason enough, right, to justify, right, the assumption of this excess structure associated with a particular preferred parameterization. Right? So, right, so in real, realist approaches to, to quantum field theory, right, we want to say, you know, we want to identify which, so which quantities in the theory are there physical matters of fact about. Right, and so, right, there are three categories of quantity, I would say, right, so there are those that are uncontroversially a matter of convention, right, so for example, choice of gauge. Right, so one doesn't really want to be a realist about those, although you know, I'm sure that that, that hypothesis has been entertained to some extent. Um, uncontroversially not a matter of convention are things like scattering cross sections and pole masses, right? So we should be a realist in some sense about these. But you know, with the Lagrangian parameters themselves, I think there's no consensus, right? So so should we be realist about the, the Lagrangian parameters? And uh, on the condensed matter view of EFTs, the answer is yes, right? There's one set of parameters that define the theory once and for all. Right, and that one can measure in principle, right? EFTs without fundamental parameters, right? The, the, the point of view that I'm advocating here is no, we shouldn't be realistic about the parameters of the theory, 
right? In the context of an EFT, one should be realist only about scheme independent quantities and the choice of parameters is a, a matter of convention, right? And so, and so, right, so as far as the implications of, for naturalness of, the, of, this, of, of this, this, this kind of way of looking at EFTs, right? It's, it basically allows us to transform away the fine tunings, right? So the fine tunings in the bare version, right, can be removed just by lowering the value of Lambda, right? So there's no actual need to parameterize the theory at the physical cutoff, right? We can lower Lambda right, to any point along the RG trajectory, um, right? So, so, um, yeah, so, so, so basically, you know, these, these, these kind of delicate cancellations are just artifacts of, of, a, of a convention. Uh, and then the fine tunings in the renormalized version of the argument can be removed by transforming from the MS bar to the on shell scheme without altering the physical scope or the content of the EFT. Right. And so just to finish with a bit of an analogy, right. Um, so, right. So, so, so saying that there's some sort of, you know, mysterious coincidence in the cancellation between say the, you know, the, the, the bare Higgs mass and, and the quantum corrections is a bit like, you know, saying that it's mysterious that, you know, the, the you know, if, if we put our origin at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, that say, you know, something like Memorial Church and Widener Library, right, that those two vectors agree to very precise measure, right, and, and, and considering that to be a mystery, right, so, so, so it's like asking yourself, you know, well, oh, it's, it's such a mystery that, you know, Widener Library and, and Memorial Church, right, are, are somehow, you know, they, they, they almost have exactly the same location, right, and clearly that's just an artifact of the origin that's one, one's chosen. Right, so just to, to, to sum up, right, so, so I have argued that all formulations of the naturalist principle relevant to the prediction of BSM signatures at the LHC, right, rely, rely tacitly on some suspension, right, so they rely tacitly on the assumption of a physically preferred parameterization and a loosening of either regularization or renormalization scheme independence. And the grounds for believing in such a parameterization, I've argued, are thin, right, since the confirmed empirical predictions of known EFTs are really scheme independent. Uh, and since the assumption of a preferred parameterization constitutes an idle wheel, so it's not necessary to generate the confirmed predictions of high energy EFTs, it should be abandoned. And so the resulting view of EFTs also requires a revision of certain influential dogmas about the interpretation of the cutoff regulator lambda, right, the Wilsonian renormalization group, the finite cutoff path integral, the connection between bare and renormalized parameterizations, and the role of lambda in defining the Hilbert space. So, so it's, it's, it's the same formalism in, in most respects. Right, but it's just it's it's interpreted in in a, in a, in a substantially different way. Um, although although I think that you know as far as how one defines the Hilbert space, there are there are you know more kind of quantitative um, implications. Uh, so so given these revisions, right, the delicate cancellations and sensitivities associated with the Higgs naturalness principle are, are seen to be little more than artifacts of a convention that can be transformed away through right, an alternative but physically equivalent convention. And sorry sorry for going a bit over time. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Josh. That was a great talk. All right. So uh, our standard um, procedures, because uh, Josh has the last talk, is just to take a break now and give people a slightly longer break, and then we'll reconvene for the full hour of discussion. Uh, and you know, ostensibly we'll start with questions for Josh, but you know, there'll be opportunities to ask questions of everybody. Uh, so. Uh, I'll stop the recording right now and, and we'll take a break and we'll reconvene uh, at, at the hour for full discussion. So hang on to your questions and I'll see everybody then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.